Welcome to the Evangelism Podcast. I'm Daniel King, and I am excited about telling people about Jesus. I have a very special guest today, Barry McGuire. He is a car wax businessman who also had a tremendous uh, car show called Car Crazy on Discovery Channel for many years. But the thing that he's really excited about is evangelism. Mr. Barry, thank you so much for being on the Evangelism Podcast. Thank you. Greatly honored. And we are soulmates in every respect. We've not met me, each other before, but we are, we are definitely soulmates. I love everything you say and do. I just say it, amen, amen, amen. And uh, and uh, thank you for all that you're doing and the people you're influencing to get off the bench and into the game. Well, thank you. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was with Steve Strang from Charisma Media. Oh. And I interviewed him for the Evangelism Podcast. And he says, now I got a guy that you have to meet, Barry <laughs> McGuire. We're oh, publishing God. a book for him. And he is an evangelist through and through. People think he's a car guy, but really he's excited about evangelism. Well, and I'm both. So I'm both. I am a car guy. I love my business. I love waxing eloquent on cars. And uh, I'm a part of this. There's 30 million car guys just in the United States. And uh, I love this community. I said... I often meet Christians at car guy events and say and the best thing in the world is to be a Christian, know the Lord and, and be able to enjoy the car hobby because the car people in the car hobby are, are really quite special and they're really exhibiting everything the scriptures um, tell us to do. I mean, they're the most generous, caring people on a global basis. There's, there's something about the DNA of a car guy. I know it's hard for you to understand a few moments, but it's, it's crazy. The problem is this. Most car guys are so good, they think they're on their way to heaven because they're good. And I find it's easier to reach a scoundrel with the gospel than, than it is a lot of car guys who, some of my, I call it chumming. I'm always throwing out chum, you know, just to try to get, get their hunger going. And some I've been doing that for 20, 30 years, and they're just so good. They can't conceive of a God who would who would send them to hell. And I say, he didn't send you to hell. He didn't send anybody to hell, you know, but you have to make a choice, you know, and they know who Jesus is. They would swear to sack of Bible. Jesus, the son of God. They know that. They, they know that. But the thought of bowing down to him and bending their knees and, and giving control of their life or it's, it's because they've got, you know, a lot of car guys have, they can do about anything they want to do. And it, it just breaks my heart that they could hold on to this world so tightly, like it's never going to go away when it's falling apart all around us. So uh, I, I often say, even so come Lord Jesus, but then I immediately say, wait a minute. <laughs> I got too many people. I got to get on the bus before we get, before, before we're out of here, you know? So you know what I'm talking about. That's awesome. Well, I really wanted to ask your perspective as a businessman, because a lot of people, they, have a, a sense that the Great Commission, telling people about Jesus, is the job of the evangelist, someone like me, or like a, a pastor, someone who is in the clergy. Uh, but you've been a businessman your whole life, and yet God has used you in a powerful way in the area of business. How can God use a businessman to bring people to Jesus? Well, first of all, let me say, I think you clarified it about as any as well as anybody there there is the evangelist the people that are called to be an evangelist okay then there's the work of evangelism that we're all called to and we are we're all all of us are in full-time ministry i say you know you're in full-time ministry whether you like it or not everything you say or do is moving people closer further away from god if you're a christian people are watching you and everything you say and do is moving, whether you want to or not, you can't get away from it. You can't get, you can't escape it. Everything you say and do is moving everybody watch you closer or further away from God. I often also say, um, you are a witness. You're already a witness. You may be a witness for the prosecution, <laughs> but you're a witness. People are judging or are, are, are making their decision on God based on what they're seeing with Christians. Of course, we know that that's a pretty sad state right now because most people don't want to be um, uh, like Christians. They look at them, they call them heavy. I had one last night I was talking to you on the street. And says, I, I want God, but I don't want to be with Christians. I hate Christians. I thought, what a what a clear, pure um, commentary on where the church is today. We don't realize how easily we 
we move people away from God. You know, the most common one would be after church on Sunday. We go to church, we go to church, we go out afterwards. Probably several of us in a little larger group, a little more demanding, stay a little longer than we should. Talking about God, the waiters server knows that we're from the church, you know, oh my, here we go again. And then when they leave, they stiff the waiter, you know. Now, did they just move that server closer, further away from it without even realizing it? Praise God. All right. See you later. <laughs> and this person that's a soul that God loves has just been left devastated. Servers don't like to work on Sunday afternoons because of church people. So um, there's there's all kinds of ways to share our faith is that that uh, nonverbal and, and verbal. But the point is, you got to be intentional. You got to realize we're full time. It's full time. It's not not part-time. There's nothing that you and I do, nothing that any of us do as Christians that's secular. We meet secular people, but there's no such thing as a secular conversation. Every conversation, every intonation, everything we're doing is sacred. It's, it's an opportunity to move them closer to Jesus. When you realize that, it changes your life. Now, one of the things I really liked about your new book, Ignite Your Life, is that this book is chock full of anecdotes stories about people that you met that you helped bring closer to jesus can you share some of those stories with us and and, and, and tell us about how you can bring people closer to jesus well first off you know the, the one of the biggest misconceptions about faith sharing is that you're supposed to share with them and get them on the knees and pray the sinner's prayer one step and i started out that way and i still find people today that think that's 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 the norm and of course it's absurd it's it's God's timing, and the average person takes you know it, it'd be twenty encounters before they finally accept the Lord, and we don't know where we are along. The Scripture is very clear on that. Some some or the seed sows on on hard ground, and some it's fertile, and some it's shallow. And so I mean that's that's what the Scripture says. If we follow what the Scriptures say, we pretty much ignore about everything all the evangelism programs say. You like. You know, get one person saved today, okay? Well, out of all the people I'm going to be with today that are going to help, uh, I'm supposed to pick one, okay? Uh, how do I pick that one? And and then what about all the others? I just let them go to hell? I mean, help me, help me with this, you know? And um, uh, living a good life, most Christians think share, living a good life is, is sharing your faith, but living a good life doesn't get you or anybody else in to heaven and yet most evangelicals i don't know what that term means anymore but most people that call themselves evangelicals um think that just being good will, will get them there and will move people closer so you, if, if christians attach god to all the good they were doing we'd be a christian world because we are doing a lot of good but but it makes us puffs us up and we feel really good about doing good you know and say well god must be really proud of me i was really generous right then it, but it brings us glory not them so how do you connect and 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 <clears throat> i'm sorry but recitation of a script doesn't seem to do that real well i i, I thank god for evangelism programs i really do i know millions of people have been brought to the lord but because of them but most of them don't most of us don't go to evangelism programs and we're not trained so how do we do it the real thing you're saying I, I really like one one story that you shared in here you said you're going through an evangelism script and you'd always get to like the second step <laughs> and you lose your place and then the person you're talking to would ask a completely different question you then you get mad at them and mad at oh, god no. because they weren't sticking with the script and then you try and bring them back all right so if, if you don't have a script how do you uh, live jesus from the inside so that uh, you can be led in the right direction to helping people you know, come closer to jesus that's that's the key question and and it comes to me in several ways uh you know jesus said They'll, they'll know you're my disciple by how well you recite your script. No, not actually, no. <laughs> you know, he said, they'll know you're my disciple by your love. We don't need training to love on people. And everybody's starving for love. And when you love on people when they're hurting, they will turn to tears pretty quickly. It's amazing. People have this smile, but just right on. That's why we see so much anger today. You do just a little thing wrong, you get shot today. I mean, the, there's this veneer of smile, but underneath there's hurt. And when you come to them, not in anger, but you come to them in love, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit confirms it to them. You know, Jerry Ruth, the author of 
uh, the Sacrament of Evangelism, you probably read that book, but he talks about how God's already sovereignly working with each person. When we come in, we enter into the sacred moment. We're becoming a, a physical manifestation of what God is already putting in their hearts. So it's this, this every relation, every conversation is is amazing. And when you love on people, they just they just open up. Let's see if I can. I mean, there's there's <laughs> I got a million of them. I've, Karen, I've been sharing our faith every day for 50 years. Okay. That's amazing. And, and because of that, he's just done amazing things with our lives and our business and whatever. But um, well, well, I tell you, I, I, I jumped in a taxi one day. I was at the Marriott Hotel downtown Detroit. I was going to Cobo Hall. And it was a five minute walk, but it was seven degrees. Okay. <laughs> so I, uh, I jumped in. I said, hey, I just got to get a short ride. But I'll give you a big tip. The guy yells at me. I don't want a tip. What? <laughs> I don't want a tip. Excuse me, sir. Why don't you want a tip? I'm a bad person. I don't deserve a tip. That's he yelled at worse than that. You know, talk about hurting. I, I got so many stories like this, but here's the thing. Mark 13, 11 says, um, don't prepare. How do you prepare for those conversations? You can't let's see. So step one. <laughs> oh. And then Luke 12, 12 says, I'll give you the word to say when you need them. And that's the fun part of it, folks. When you just step in and just do it, there's no preparation. You have nothing. All of a sudden, you're face to face with somebody, and their son just committed suicide, or they just got the call they got cancer. I mean, you can't prepare for those conversations. And when you just love on them and tear with them and generally love on them, and then the Holy Spirit gives you the words to say, it's, it's the craziest thing. There's no other way to have this kind of intimacy with God than to allow God to speak to you. You see this life in front of you changing. In this case, I said to this man, um, do you know God loves you? No. <laughs> I said, yeah, he loves you. No. <laughs> he's just he's just so angry. Poor man. I said, sir, I, I, I'm a student of the Bible. I'm a Christian. And I know the Bible really well. And I can tell you for sure, absolutely positive, he loves you. Now he says nothing. I said, you know what? Even even better. Do you know he loves you as much as he's ever loved anybody ever? Dead quiet. I said, you know, it gets even better than that. Do you know he loves you? I'm laughing, telling him. I said, do you realize that God loves you as much as he loves his own son, Jesus Christ? That's how much he loves you. Dead quiet. Well, we're now we're at Cobo Hall. I get out. It's snowing. I remember the salt in the windows, the windows going down. He's looking at me like, he's, he's speechless. He's never heard this. He thinks God hates him. It's over. And I said, you know, uh, sir, God put me in your taxi just now because he wants you to know that he loves you and he wants you to spend eternity with him. And then I gave him a really big tip. I said, God bless you. Have a great day. And I walked away. Yes. <laughs> Did I get him saved? Of course not. Did I move him cl closer to Jesus? You better believe it. I may have saved him from committing suicide that day. And so that basic theme, there's so many ways to say it. it never, people come in, they, get, they have this sentence. They set up everybody. If you were to die today, do you know you'd go to heaven? Whatever. They have a million of these things. And they do it every, over and over with everybody. Well, everybody isn't everybody. Each person's an individual. And you allow the Holy Spirit to do it. And the moment you go to script, it gets plastic. It gets static. It's, something, it's like you just say it because that's what you're supposed to say. But when you love on people, when we love on our friends, we don't recite a script or have anything prepared. We just love on them. We're broken for them. And when we do that, people break. And they within five minutes, they're telling you, you know how it works. Within five minutes, they're telling you things they won't tell their best friends. And then you know the point of need. Then God gives you the scriptures. And you see the change in front of your eyes and you're praying, you're hugging. I, I, I pulled up the other day in front of a, a restaurant. My friend, it was kind of an open parking lot, but for some reason he pulled this place and right in front of us was a, was a black guy in a tank top, tattooed, dreadlocks, all filling his radiator with a great big bottle of water. You know? <laughs> so I, I said, Hey, can I help you? He said, no, I got it under control. I just have a leaky radiator and, I just driven here from Alabama. I just just got in town, and I just made sure I have to make sure I have a lot of water. And I said, "So what you doing?" So I found out that he left his wife 
and, and daughter at home to get a job. He thought he could drive a truck. Have you driven a truck? No, but I have a friend here. He says I can drive a truck. Also, I'm talking about God's plan for his life. And he'll, God wants to guide and direct him and take all that fear off. And I, when I was a kid, I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't know where I was going to go. I had, I was kind of the same situation. I just prayed, you know, trust the Lord with your whole heart. I gave all this stuff. Before we know it, we're praying. He's hugging me. <laughs> and then we have a little card we give people. At the end of every conversation like that, we have a little card that says seeking God. A little business card, seeking God. You can order them for free. There's, there's no cost to them. And it's a robust site that tells them everything they need to know. It's testimonies, videos, the Bible, whatever. It would take them easily from no knowledge of God to the sinner's prayer. And so rather than just leaving somebody like that, uh, well, I hope they find a church somewhere, you give them the card and say, would you like to know more about God? And they say, yes. I say, well, here's a card you can have. It'll tell you everything you want to know. So, wow, I that's mean, amazing. the privilege of doing that is so, it's so much fun. It gives you joy when you're, when you're bearing fruit, John 15, 11 says, when you bear fruit, my joy remain with you and, and your joy remain full. If you want to have joy, this, who, who knew <laughs> having joy is directly connected with bearing fruit, with loving our neighbors. It, it is the great commission after all. <laughs> yeah. Your joy is really infectious. It makes me want to go out and, and witness right now and lead someone <laughs> to Jesus because you're right. The Bible says that all the angels of heaven rejoice when one sinner gets saved, and there's no feeling like that feeling of, of bringing someone to the point where they they make Jesus the Lord of their life, and they turn away from hell and turn towards heaven. I mean, that is such a, a joyful occasion. Another and idea that you have that I really love is that you consider witnessing to be a team sport. Yeah. Oh, Can yeah. you explain what that means and, and why you feel that it's a team sport? Yeah, well, take the gentleman and the, and, and the taxi driver, you know. Did I get him saved? No. <clears throat> I, I I maximized my time with him. I had a five-minute window, and I moved him down the line, but that didn't get him saved. But God is sovereignly moving with each person, and it is a team sport. It is a team sport. Well, if I On the times when I lead somebody to the Lord, and that's a very small percentage of all the people I talk with, but I know there there may have been 20 people before me so I'm celebrating not that look what I did, but look what God did through a whole bunch of us. And we won't know until we get to heaven, all the people played a role in that, you know? So uh, yeah, God uses Christians. He brings us in. He orchestrates their steps and our steps. It's amazing how that happens. I mean, I got all kinds of stories. And I can tell you one just real quick. I, I was going to dinner <clears throat> and I had to get there first so I could give the waiter my credit card before my friend got there. It was always a contest between us who was going to get the bill, right? So my Uber app didn't work. I said, Karen, we got to get outside the hotel to, to uh, uh, so the Uber app will work. So we get out. It didn't work outside either. So Karen says, um, better, you better get that taxi right there. So I said, okay, sir, I'll, I, I, I'll take that taxi. He says, that taxi's spoken for. Well, there was nobody around me. I said, spoken for? He said, yeah, look back. There's a lady way back the, right by the front door, and it was her taxi. I said, well, how long would it take to get a taxi? He said, oh, about 15 minutes uh, because it's a busy time, and and I, my blood starts. It's like, <laughs> it's for train. I'm like, I got to get to this restaurant, right? So finally I hear, sir, sir. And I turn around, it's this lady. She says, just take my taxi. I said, why would I do that? She's, my husband's upstairs. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> I don't know how long it'll be. You can just take this taxi. I'll take the next taxi. I said, okay. We jump in the taxi and burp. Spinning rubber. The guy in his first sentence is profanity. What the hell? <laughs> you know, where, where the hell do you want to go? I forget how he said it. It was really just like, Wow. So we started asking. God brought us another one. He brought us another one, you know? I mean, it's so much fun. If, you, if you're not thinking about spiritual, you're saying, let me get out of this car as fast as I can. But when you have these things, how do you realize God's in it? It's like an adventure. And so you ask questions and you find out his wife just died from painful cancer, agony cancer. She'd been through for months, couldn't stop the pain. She had just died. He had to work. His kids were out of control and total combat, com uh, rebellion. He was just beside himself. And God gave me the scripture. Just so easy. Just effortlessly. effortlessly. I said, Je you know, Jesus says, come unto me, all, who are, all of you who are heavy burdened, and I'll give you rest. 
Bernard Havel Aiden, I give you rest. And he yells at the same intensity, man, do I need rest. <laughs> so we're, we're feeding him scriptures, Karen and I both. We finally get there. We get out of the taxi. And I said to him, he said, I need to get in church. I said to him, if you would trust me with your where, where you live and your cell number, I'll find a church for you. And, and send it to you. So, you know, where it's, oh, would you do that? So he's writing it on down. I said, can I pray for you? And he said, yeah. So the three of us in front of the headlights of the taxi, in front of the restaurant, people walking in and we laughed later about how that must have looked. And we're praying and we're all cheering and just, just emotionally involved with each other. My point is this. He, he had to stop my Uber app. Think of what he went through for that. That guy was hungry for God. He didn't know him, but he was hungry for God. He was right. So he, God stops my Uber app from working. He keeps the, the gal's husband upstairs, right? He gives her the generosity to say, go ahead and take my taxi. And then it happens to be his taxi at that moment. Woo! Look at all he orchestrated to make it so I had the opportunity to share with him. I don't know the end of the story. There's other people involved, other team players in the part of that story. Who are knowing glory. But to be a part of the team, and, and just get off the bench. If you're sitting on the bench, you atrophy and, and everything falls apart. You no longer have hunger for the word. You're no longer praying. Everything falls down. You're at worry. 80% of all Christians are in fear right now, living in fear right now. It's tragedy. But when you're sharing your faith, nobody has to tell you to read your Bible. Man, you're digging as fast as you can, trying to get answers to all the questions that you're being asked. You're saying, God, help me. I don't know what I'm doing. Help me. And thank you for bringing Bob into my life. And, I pray, and you're praying. And everything's working. It's uh, the whole Your whole spiritual life is working. You're alive. That's why he says he wants us to share our faith. And I'll give you one last scripture, which is powerful. Do you know there's actually a scripture that says why? From, from Genesis to Revelations, he says, do it. But in Isaiah 43, 10, he says, why? He says, I appoint you as my witness so that you will believe. So that you will believe. Now, I would say so that they will believe. No, he said so. And he didn't say this, so you'll believe more. He says so that you will believe. That's why he wants you to share your faith. Because once you step into that world, your entire life changes. And it's joy every day. Every day is joy. It's adventure. It's, it's, it ignites your life. That's a good name for a book. Ignite your life. <laughs> hey, that is a good name for a book. And you've written it, Ignite Your Life. Now, one of the things about car guys is that you, you never have to convince a car guy to talk about his car. All you do is ask the first question, and then they can talk forever about all the details, everything they've upgraded and, and polished and made in it minutia, yes <laughs> and and i think the same should be true as christians we shouldn't fear sharing our faith with others if you love jesus as much as a car guy loves his car then you'll talk about jesus everywhere you go do you, do you think that's true oh well, well there's no question it's it's true here's the point <clears throat> whatever you're excited about you talk about i'm excited about cars I'm excited about shiny finishes. So I love talking to you about how I can make a perfect finish on your car. Use McGuire's Car Wax. It will look like a jewel. And I, I'm so excited about talking about that. I'm excited about that. So I talk about it a lot. Um, a question for all of you listening to us right now. Are, are you are you talking about God much? If, if you're not talking about God much, you, I'm not saying you're not going to heaven. You're on your way to heaven, but I'm talking about having fun and doing what you're supposed to do. If you're talking about God, if you're not talking about God, then he probably is no longer your first love. And the easiest way to describe that is a new Christian. You know, a new Christian, you can't stop them from sharing their faith because, God, you just saved me from hell. <laughs> I'm on my way to heaven. He's my first love. So naturally, you're going to share it. You know, in, in, at the letter, in the letter to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, he says, I... I think I know you're doing all the good stuff and you give sacrificially, you know, good teaching for bad. You know all that you're there, but I have this against you. You've left your first love and you're no longer doing the first work. The first thing every Christian does is share their faith. If you're no longer loving him first, then you're no longer sharing him. So if you go to Romans, that's repeated over and over, love your neighbor as yourself. As you're, if you're as concerned for your neighbor as you are for yourself it's just concerned for their salvation as you are for yourself you you that'll your whole conversation will be 
different, right? You you do everything you can to get them into heaven. So you fulfill all 10 commandments because of the two, because now it's not out of obligations because I don't want to do anything. Can I indulge and do that? Can I look at that? Can I laugh at that? So go to heaven? Yeah, sure. But is that helping you get people to Jesus? That's the question. And the big one is Romans 8, 28, probably the most, maybe the second most well-known and misunderstood scripture in the Bible where he says, I'll make, God says this. He doesn't lie. I'll make everything in your life work together for good. Wow. Think if you knew God was going to make everything work for good in your life, even the bad stuff, make everything. That's his promise to you. But there's two things you have to do to get there. One is God having him as first love, loving him more than anything else. Nothing separating us. And secondly, in the part that's hardly ever preached, if you love me, if to those who love me, to those who live for my purpose, not your purpose, stop trying to find your purpose. He didn't have a purpose for you. He has a plan for you to fulfill his purpose. His, there's no question on this theologically. His purpose is to seek and save the lost. And so when you live your life to seek and save the lost, to love your neighbor as yourself, to love God first and do the first work, it all the whole weight of scripture comes down to this point. When you do that, then you're in sync with God, and then you have God flowing through you, and that's when you know nobody can take your faith away from you. 80% of Christians need to hear this today. 80% of Christians are living in fear. If you're living in fear, you can't, you're not living in faith. If you don't have faith, you can't share your faith. That's the bottom line for us. We got to get people out of fear. And it's so easy. Just do the basic, simple things God tells us to do. Love on people. I had, I had a lady at our uh, home this weekend under great duress. She loves the Lord, but Satan just having a heyday with her. And it was so easy to change her from this, this poor me thing, folks. Yeah, she was just confessing, confessing, confessing bad stuff, all this bad stuff. You know better than this. You know the scriptures. Let me just remind you. And over a period of a day, all of a sudden, she just she just hugged me before I, I came and joined you. She's, I got joy. I got my mojo back. I'm back. I'm good. I just, and it was just understanding the truth that she already knew. It, it's 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 like a Pat Boone wrote a book a long time ago. It's like having a big check account and not cashing any checks with it. God wants to pour out His blessings on us, but we restrict Him by our lack of faith. If we don't have if we don't have faith, if we're wavering, if we're part of the eighty percent that have fear, then we fall in that category in James one, where He says, "If you're wavering, I don't I don't don't expect me to answer any of your prayers. You may be praying like crazy. I've done that in the past. I've been fifty years doing this." And I went through a two and a half period, year period where I was worrying like crazy. I was trusting. I knew God would solve it, to solve the problem sometime, but I was worrying like crazy in the meantime. And a preacher on the radio said to me, said one day as I was driving down the street, who's your God? I said, well, at least I got that one straight. <laughs> I'm okay at that one. He's like, I'm going to ask again, who's your God? I thought, oh, I've heard enough of that. I started to change the station. I'll tell you who's your God. Well, whatever fills your prayers is your God. And we are so easily prone to pray for this ministry or this urgency or this problem or this cancer or whatever the problem is. And it's like, God, help us, help me with my God. <laughs> you just can't do that. God is God. He will never let us down. And when, when we're in perfect harmony with God, when we live for his purpose to seek and save the lost. And when you do that, it, it will ignite your life. Guaranteed. It's so simple. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, as a minister, I want to say thank you to you as a businessman, because over the years, you've been very successful in business, but you haven't just kept all your success for yourself. You've also done, a, you've helped so many other ministries. You've helped James Dobson with Focus on the Family, David Wilkerson, the Assemblies of God Missions Board. You have poured your time and talents back into the kingdom of God. And I think that's so valuable for businessmen to understand that they have a very essential role to play in the kingdom of God. And, and so what advice would you give to businessmen who want to be used by God in a powerful way? What a great question. Um, you know, at, at one point I thought God was calling me into quote unquote full-time ministry. And it was, believe it or not, it was 1976. Okay. 1976. And, um, 
I, I prayed the most fervent prayer of my life. I, I, I love my business. I love everything about my business. I, I could see where we were just starting retail. Now we're the number one selling car wax in the country. But right there, we we're just starting. And I had this dream. I believe God gave it to me. This was my baby. But um, I was feeling like he was taking me into full-time ministry because I was having so much fun sharing my faith. And so I prayed. I said, God, if you want me to leave my business and go into full-time ministry, I will do that. I, I said it through tears. I will do that. But I'm almost going to have to hear from you with an audible voice. Because I need to know for sure. And if it's for sure, then I'm gone. I'm, I'm with you all the way, uh, either, whatever way you want me to go. So about 20 minutes later, a, a guy came into my office. The secretary said, there's a David Nett here to see you. And I thought, well, that's strange. I knew this guy. I didn't really know this guy. He, he, he attended my church, but I didn't know him. He'd struggled from the platform a couple of times. So I knew he was a missionary kid, grew up in Africa, about my same age. But I'd never even exchanged a glance with him. And here he's walking into my office. And I said, well, hi, Dave. How you doing? He said, well, I was in the area, thought I'd stop by and just ask, my, how's, how's it going? So I made a snap decision. He wasn't into shiny paint finishes. So I, I started telling him about um, uh, experiences I was having. And this was the defining moment of my life. And I think it answers your question. He said, God's given you a wonderful ministry here, hadn't he? I said, wait a minute. I mean, after just praying this prayer, that was a pretty astounding statement. He was raised. I'd seen them overlapping, but still I'm a businessman. I'm a Christian. I see these two different things. He, he says, um, uh, God's given you a wonderful ministry here, hadn't he? And I said, why would you say that? He said, well, a, a pastor can't reach the people you're reaching, but as a businessman, you can. And he gave me this line in 1976. It's obvious that your business is your pulpit. Whoa, that means they're overlapping. There's no separation. My business is my pulpit. That was amazing. I just, oh my goodness. So I told him, I just prayed this prayer about 20 minutes ago. He said, well, that explains it. I said, explains what? He said, I was driving up Red Hill. I just dropped missionaries off at Orange County Airport in Irvine. I was driving up Red Hill, the closest main street to my office. He said, and God spoke to me and said, go see Barry McGuire. And I'd seen your building. I'd seen your name on it. I put together with the name of church. But I, I argued with God all the way to your office saying, I don't know this guy. I don't know what kind of business he's in. I going to make a fool out of myself. But God wouldn't let me go. What if he had not been obedient? I would have been a failure as a pastor. I'm not a pastor. I'm a full-time ministry, but I'm not a pastor. My business is my pulpit. Wherever you are, folks, if you're in business, your business is your pulpit. It's secondary. Don't ever let that capture your prayers and, and your joy. Don't ever. God, our joy is in God, and we love him. The more I spent time serving him and sharing him, the more he blessed my business. Like there's a wake behind me. I keep looking at my business. It's getting bigger. Now I'm working hard for the business, but my joy and my Everything my focus is how can I even when I get turned down in sales calls, my goal is I want to move them closer to Jesus. <laughs> I don't care if I get the sale because I know when I live that way, He promises me that everything's going to work for good. You live in this promise that promise is yours. He's promising you, I'll make everything in your life work together for good if you when you live for my purpose. It's so simple. And, and who knew it works? I mean, the scriptures actually work. And after 50 years of this tiny little business to where we are now and the influence we have to move people closer to Jesus, and it's a joy. It's just so much joy. Take my business away from me. Take my house. I don't care. I got joy, you know? And um, it, it just ignites your life. I mean, I think you enjoy the book because it tells a lot of, it, it's, it's a book of scriptures. The scriptures will set you free. The, the scriptures will ignite your life. My life story is just trappings around it to kind of put in perspective what the word of God is really saying. Well, if you're listening, I encourage you to get a copy of the book. It's called Ignite Your Life by Barry McGuire. This would be a great book to read. And if you have someone in your life who is enthusiastic about cars, maybe grandpa or an uncle who has a, an old car that they, they love to wax and polish, this would be a great book to give them to be a witness to them. I, I guarantee they've heard of Barry McGuire and they, they would love hearing the story of how excited he is about sharing his faith. And if you want to be excited about sharing your faith, get a copy of this book. It will really encourage you. I'd also encourage you to go to the website, igniteamerica.com. 
for more information about Barry McGuire. And Brother Barry, thank you so much for being on the Evangelism Podcast. I just love your enthusiasm. I love your joy. And it really is a pleasure to get to know you. Thank God you. bless you. Greatly honored. Greatly honored. Blessing on you. Daniel King is on a mission to save one million souls a year, but he can't do it alone. Would you consider sowing a financial seed today? To give, please visit www.kingministries.com.